Um, so we're going to uh, talk about algorithmic bias in the first half of class, and then we'll get into the transformer architecture after that. And you know, my plan with this is to offer um, kind of some different ex case studies around bias. Not all of them are NLP related, but I've added um, kind of additional NLP examples um, since this is an important topic debunk some kind of common misconceptions and also um, offer this kind of system for classifying types of bias, which can be useful. And then towards the end, I'll get into some steps towards addressing bias. Um, but this is kind of a very important and relevant issue that um, you'll be seeing as you start your, your first jobs as data scientist. Uh, so good to know that algorithms can encode and magnify human bias. And this is one of the things that worries me about machine learning, even though there's a, lo a lot that I love about machine learning. And so I'm going to go, go through a few case studies. Um, the first is facial recognition and predictive policing. And also, as usual, feel free to stop me if you have questions as I go. So this is a research by Joy Balamwini and Timnit Gebru that came out last year that evaluated commercial computer vision products from IBM, Microsoft, and Face++, which is a large Chinese company. And it found that these products performed worse on women than on men and worse on people with dark skin compared to people with light skin. And then there was also this kind of intersectional effect where it was worst of all on dark skinned women. So to give one example, IBM's product was 99.7% accurate on light-skinned men and only 65.3% accurate on dark-skinned women. And again, this was a commercial product that was released, and that's a horrifying difference in accuracy uh, to have between those, uh, those two groups. So uh, they did a follow-up study, Joy Balamwini and Deb Raji, looking at uh, a new set of companies and found that Amazon has the, the same problem. And this is particularly concerning as, um, oh, actually I should say first, uh, there was a separate study by the ACLU that looked at the technology Amazon is selling to police departments and found that it misidentified 28 uh, Congress people as uh, criminals. <laughs> and this disproportionately included people of color in the ones that were being misidentified as criminals. And this, this technology is already in use and it's almost completely unregulated in the US. Um, so there's really kind of no oversight uh, or accountability of how it's being used or what its accuracy is. Um, and I'll talk more about uh, there's this risk of runaway feedback loops and predictive policing that's, that's been documented and studied. Um, it's not just Amazon. Uh, IBM is also selling predictive policing technology, as, pa as is Palantir and other companies. Um, so there's a city in California using uh, IBM Watson dashboard for predictive policing. And a city official there said, with machine learning, with automation, there's a 99% success. Uh, so that robot is will be 99% accurate in telling us what's going to happen next. Um, this is <laughs> completely false. This is a common misconception, though, that people have about machine learning. And it's really important to keep in mind as you're building machine learning products to know that that users um, often think that computers are more accurate and more uh, more objective than they are. I um, mean, it's in this case, it's very horrifying that uh, kind of a city official using this has this misconception. So algorithmic bias. Um, as you know well, computers make mistakes. Um, unjust algorithmic bias is one of those mistakes. Machine learning involves algorithms learning from data. That data is often biased. And algorithmic systems are disproportionately uh, being used on the poor. So there's kind of a difference in who's feeling the impact of, uh, um, of when there is bias and, and inaccuracy. Kathy O'Neill has written a great book. Kathy O'Neill is a fellow math PhD. Um, she wrote Weapons of Math Destruction. Uh, goes through a number of case studies of kind of how algorithmic systems are being used in different sectors, such as hiring, firing, education, uh, criminal justice system. So st statistical bias is a kind of technical term, um, the difference between a statistics expected value and the true value. 
Uh, unjust bias is a disproportionate preference for or prejudice against a group. Um, today, when I'm talking about bias, I'll primarily be talking about unjust bias, um, not, the, not the statistical term. And then I'll also talk a little bit about unconscious bias, which are biases that we don't realize we have. Uh-huh. Sometimes when people are confused that there's also a thing in our neural networks called the bias. Yes, so bias, yeah, is also, which is kind of related though to statistical bias, because basically when you have that difference, that's what you're trying to learn. Um, but yes, uh, when you're learning the weights and the bias in a um, neural network, that's kind of the, you know, basically like the multiplier and the constant. Uh, but again, here I'll be focusing on um, unjust bias. So there was a paper I really liked earlier this year by Harini Suresh and John Gutag that identified that different sources of bias have different causes and they kind of come into play at different points in the pipeline of generating data, selecting a population, making measurements, uh, training a model, deploying that. And it's really helpful to kind of have a little bit more of a framework around this because as we'll get into later, bias can be a very kind of generic term and sometimes it's too generic to be useful. Um, and so this will kind of give us a way to identify different types um, and their causes. And so returning to gender shades, this is an example of representation bias, uh, where kind of the data set was not representative of the people that might, uh, the algorithm might be used on later. And it's also an example of evaluation bias. And so here, uh, so in, in machine learning in general, uh, benchmark data sets spur on a lot of research. And so in some ways they're great, they lead to a lot of progress in the field, but if there are biases in benchmark data sets, they can really be kind of propagated at scale when everyone's studying the same, the same few data sets. And so part of kind of why all these companies had issues of bias in their facial recognition is that a lot of the kind of major facial recognition data sets had very few dark skinned women in them. And so for instance, IGBA, um, as of a few years ago, only 4% of the pictures in it were dark skinned women. Another example is ImageNet. There is a great paper from Shreya Shankar et al. in 2017 highlighting that two thirds of ImageNet images are from the West. And I think ImageNet is probably like by far the most well studied computer vision data set. Um, and so this is the breakdown. Yellow is the US, that's 45% of the images. Great Britain had 7.6% of the images. 6% were from Italy, 3% from Canada. 2.8% from Australia, 2.5% from Spain. And so we've covered like two thirds of this pie and haven't gotten outside the West. And so this has shown up in kind of several ways. For instance, bridegroom, so a man getting married is a, one of the categories in ImageNet. And uh, Shreya Shankar found that it can't, uh, uh, classifiers trained on ImageNet don't recognize bridegrooms from India, Pakistan, um, kind of Egypt, places outside the West. Um, there was also, I meant to update this, a paper that just came out in the last few weeks from Facebook where they looked at household items like toothpaste or soap around the world, and again, found that the error rates were higher outside the West. And so I think this is something we'll probably continue to see implications from just because it's been such a widely used and widely studied data set. So one, uh, one step towards trying to address th th this is to create more representative data sets. And this is what Joy Balamwini did as part of her research. And she used uh, pictures of politicians from countries around the world to uh, make a more diverse and more representative data set. And then I need to credit Deb Raji, who is a collaborator with Joy Balamwini on the Amazon research uh, for bringing up this point in a talk I saw her give two weeks ago. Um, she really emphasized though that uh, when you're creating a more diverse data set, really when you're creating any data set, it's important to keep in mind issues of consent, exploitation, and privacy. Because basically after this research came out, um, IBM said, okay, we'll make a more <laughs> diverse data set. And they scraped a bunch of photos from Flickr without getting people's consent beforehand, which is not a good solution. 
Um, and there are other issues with uh, China is kind of currently partnered with Zimbabwe uh, to get more images of black faces, but in a way that's not really taking into account the consent of uh, citizens of Zimbabwe. So there can be, a, I guess, a tension between this of getting representative sets, but in a way that is um, not exploitative. So the second case study I wanna look at is recidivism algorithms used in prison sentencing. So ProPublica did an investigation that came out in 2016 on the Compass recidivism algorithm. And this is software sold by a private company that's used in the criminal justice system. And it's used at several points in the criminal justice system. So it can be used in determining who needs to pay parole, um, or sorry, pay, uh, pay bail. And this is before someone's even had a trial. In the US, I believe half a million people are currently in prison because they're too poor to afford bail. Um, and, and this is before, before they've even had a trial. Uh, the software can be used in determining uh, sentencing decisions and parole decisions. So something having a huge, huge impact on people's lives. And ProPublica found that the false positive rate, so that people that were incorrectly labeled as being at a high risk of committing another crime but did not, was 45% for black defendants, which is really, really high false positive rate. Um, again, this is for a commercial product that's widely in use, impacting people's lives. And to contrast that, the false positive rate for white defendants was 23.5%. Um, so this is huge difference kind of between the groups. Uh, there was research from Dartmouth last year that showed that this uh, the software is no more accurate than mechanical Turk workers. So random people on the internet uh, are as good at guessing if someone's going to commit another crime as the software. They also compared, so uh, the Compass recidivism algorithm is a black box with 137 inputs. It's kind of protected as proprietary content, how it works. And it was not any more accurate than I think a linear classifier on three variables. Um, so that's it's pretty horrifying, um, and it's still in use. Uh, one place that was challenged was Wisconsin, but the Wisconsin Supreme Court upheld its use. And this, uh, this relates to different definitions of fairness, which is kind of outside the scope of the talk for today. But Arvind Naranyan, who's a Princeton professor, has a great talk, uh, 21 Definitions of Fairness, that gets into this more. And I'll just say, while there are different definitions of fairness, um, I don't know of anybody outside of the company that creates the Compass Recidivism algorithm that thinks that the definition they're using is a particularly good one or one that maps to kind of our notions of fairness. So a, a key point that I want to emphasize, and this kind of I see people make this mistake a lot in the, in the media, um, is that even when race and gender are not inputs, your, uh, your algorithm can still be biased because machine learning, basically the whole purpose of machine learning is to find latent variables. And so even if you're not explicitly recording race or gender, they're latently encoded in a bunch of other variables. And so you can still end up with biased algorithms. And this is kind of a common misconception. You'll hear kind of a tech executives saying, well, I don't have to worry about bias because we're, you know, we're not looking at race or we're not looking at gender. You do still need to be concerned. And in the case of the Compass recidivism algorithm, race was not an input. Um, so it's kind of ending up with these very biased results without using race as an explicit input. Another, another reason to be worried is that machine learning can amplify bias. Um, so it's not just that it's encoding kind of existing bias, but in some cases it's amplifying it. Um, there are two studies that I like on this. Uh, one was looking at a data set of kind of images of people doing different things. And in the data set, 67% of the people um, cooking are women. And so the algorithm ends up learning to predict that if someone's cooking, it's probably a woman at a rate of 84%. So kind of giving more biased outputs than what was seen in the training data. And this was, uh, this was written about in Wired, the study. Another one, uh, Bias and Bios <coughs> um, by Maria de Artiga et al. 
Uh, they looked at uh, predicting people's job titles based off of their LinkedIn description. And again, they found this kind of mechanism under which bias was compounded. So in their data set, only 14% of the surgeons were women, and they ended up with predictions in which um, only 11% of the, the true positives were, were women for surgeons. Um, and so basically kind of there's differences in errors of kind of who's having false positives versus false negatives of like what kind of error you get where bias is compounded. And so returning to this idea of there being different types of bias and kind of like what's the, what's the root cause of this bias, this is an example of historical bias. Um, historical bias is a fundamental structural issue with the first step of the data generation process and can exist even given perfect sampling and feature selection. So this is something where the, the Compass uh, recidivism algorithm is probably not going to be fixed by taking a different uh, underlying data set um, of kind of criminal justice history in the US. Um, that's not going not gonna to solve it. One, uh, one step towards doing better is to try to talk to domain experts and those impacted. And this is good advice for any sort of application you're working on. And so an example of it comes from Christian Lum, who is a statistician at the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Um, and she organized a workshop at the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency in ML conference uh, last year. And she partnered with Elizabeth Bender, who's a former public defender and an attorney for human, um, New York's Legal Aid Society, as well as Terrence Wilkerson, who's an innocent man who was arrested and could not afford bail. And he was also kind of given a high risk rating by the Compass Recidivism Algorithm. And this is available online. You can watch this tutorial. Uh, but it's really gives a lot of insight of things I wouldn't know about how the criminal justice system works in practice. Because it's, you know, we kind of make these uh, computer programs often in a more, you know, abstract, nicely isolated um, environment. And then they're kind of plugged into these really messy real world systems. Uh, and it's important to understand those and to understand the impact. Um, so for instance, Elizabeth Bender shares that to visit a client on Rikers Island, uh, which is where Terrence Wilker Wilkerson was held uh, pre-trial, uh, the attorneys having to travel two hours each way by bus to only get 30 minutes with the client. And that's assuming the, uh, the guards even bring him in on time. They're kind of a lot of, uh, things that make this really difficult in practice that are important to know about uh, for anyone designing, designing these systems. And let me get a drink of water. And actually, I should check any questions so far. All right, the, the third case study I wanted to look at is online ad delivery. I think this is a really important one since ads kind of power so much of the internet and some uh, kind of so many of the major, major tech companies. So Latanya Sweeney is a professor at Harvard and director of their data privacy lab. And she noticed um, several years ago that when, when she Googled her name, she would get these search results or get ads that say, LaTanya Sweeney arrested, um, kind of implying that she had an arrest record. And this is from a company that does background checks. And LaTanya Sweeney is the only person with her name um, in the US. She does not have an arrest record. She paid you know, the $50 to do the background check and found it says she has zero arrest. Uh, but she tried Googling some other names and noticed that some of the ads were a lot more neutral. So uh, Kristen Lindquist got these ads that say, we found Kristen Lindquist, even though Kristen Lindquist has three arrests um, if you pay for the, the background check. So there's this very misleading element. And being a computer scientist, Latanya Sweeney studied this in a very systematic way. She looked at over 2,000 names. Oh, she also, these are all images from her paper. Uh, she did Google images, image search, searches and saw these are the images returned for LaTanya versus the images returned for Kristen, and then kind of confirmed this with over 2,000 names that uh, black names were more likely to return these 
add results suggesting that the person had been arrested, regardless of whether, the, if, whether they had, and white names returned more neutral ads, just saying, you know, we found so and so. Um, and this is something that could have had a kind of a direct impact on people's uh, chances getting hired for something. If an employer is, you know, searching for someone and doesn't want to pay for the background check, or maybe doesn't even consciously register that they saw this ad suggesting that someone was perhaps arrested, that could still um, kind of influence how they uh, how they saw the person. And it's also um, kind of wrong from a representational. Uh, this is what Kate Crawford calls a representational harm to suggest that there's this relationship between a black name and criminality. And this was covered in the MIT Tech Review. So that's a, that's a problem with, with online ads. There are a number of other problems. So we've seen uh, stories over the past few years of people placing Facebook ads saying, I only want young people to see this job ad. Uh, also, housing ads saying, I, I don't want black or Latino people to see this housing ad. This is something, so these were all ProPublica investigations. Uh, ProPublica pointed the housing ad issue out in 2016. Um, and I want to note that these seem like uh, violations of a lot of our civil rights laws in the US. So we have laws against um, employment discrimination based on age and ho housing discrimination based on race. Uh, Facebook was still doing it over a year after it had first been pointed out. Um, so ProPublica Pro went back in 2017 and saw it was still the case. Uh, there was a settlement earlier this year in March uh, that Facebook and we'll see if things change uh, since they've promised to change before, uh, saying that it was going to try to address this again. So that was in March. Um, in April, new research came out showing that even when the advertiser's not trying to discriminate, Facebook serves up a very skewed audience. And so the authors of the study said even a well-meaning advertiser might end up reaching a mostly white and or mostly male audience. That's because Facebook's opaque algorithms trained on historically biased data predict that those people will be most interested. And so in the study, they had job ads that they placed that they didn't specify who they wanted it to be shown to that were either shown to 90% men or were shown to 90% women based on the job ad. Similar with housing ads, they had housing ads that were shown to 90% white people. Uh, it varied, for instance, on, based on like what picture was used with the housing ad, led to these very skewed results. And I should, uh, I guess, going back to the Latanya Sweeney case of the uh, background check ads being very different, what the background check company claimed is that they were placing basically two versions of the ad for each name. And Google lets you kind of A-B test which ads are most effective. And the company says that people were clicking on the ads suggesting that people with black names had been arrested at higher rates and clicking on the neutral ads for white people and that that's where this bias came in. Um, so just kind of different, different mechanisms that, that can result in this. And so I want to I highlight here that several kind of several of these issues we're talking about the criminal justice system, policing, housing, jobs. Um, there was also you probably saw the article I guess last year about Amazon having developed an internal recruiting tool to screen resumes, and it learned to penalize resumes that had the word "women's" in it. Um, for instance, if someone had been on a women's sports team or gone to a women's college, that was penalized. Um, and these are all kind of civil rights issues. And many AI ethics, AI ethics concerns are about human rights or civil rights. There is a great article by Dominique Harrison of the Aspen Institute highlighting um, kind of how technological changes are eroding civil rights in many areas in the US, or at least contributing to them. So in thinking about, I think often people think like it's it's going to be you know, impossible to regulate tech because it's kind of such a big and complex industry. I really like the framing from Anil Dash of a few years ago saying there's no technology industry anymore. The label's too big to be useful. Tech is being used in every industry. And so um, I think we need to think about uh, kind of what human rights and what civil rights we want to protect, uh, particularly in areas of housing, education, employment, cr criminal justice. 
uh, medical care, voting, and so on. And I need to credit uh, Frederike Kalfner, who's a researcher at Privacy International, who I think did a good job of kind of like articulating this, this framing. So we need to, we need to safeguard human rights with, with thoughtful laws. So now I want to give some examples of bias in NLP. Um, so yesterday, or not yesterday, Tuesday, it was great to have Nikhil come and speak on, on his work of stereotypes and word embeddings over history. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, this is one of the papers he cited, the um, Eileen Kaliskin, Joanna Bryson, and Arvind Naranyan paper. Um, and what they did in this paper is they looked at, they called them, I think, little baskets of words. And so, for instance, this, and these are not complete, I ran out of space, but they would have kind of 20 flowers or 20 insects. Um, they had pleasant words and unpleasant words. And so, for instance, here they found that the flowers were closer to the pleasant words and the insects were closer to the unpleasant words, which is not shocking. And this is on, um, can't remember if it's word to vec or glove, but you know, on these trained word embeddings. Uh, but then they tested on things like white names and black names, and they found that white names were closer to the pleasant words and black names were closer to the unpleasant words, uh, which is very concerning. And they went through, something I like about this paper is they kind of went through a variety of papers from psychology and sociology that had looked at different uh, kind of documented biases and basically found that they were all present in word embeddings as well. So it's a good example of kind of, I think, drawing from interdisciplinary research to kind of confirm these underlying biases that have already been observed and studied in other fields. Um, so a few kind of papers I recommend on this topic. So there's the original uh, bullock bossy paper that uh, used more the style of analogies to look at biases and word embeddings. Um, and that came out, so that was 2016, as was the next one, looking at the baskets of words. And I mentioned this a little bit during the Keel's talk, but the, the Balak Bossi paper had proposed debiasing word embeddings, and the um, Kaliskin paper proposed that the debiasing should happen at the time of action. Um, and so I think that's kind of an interesting point to keep in mind of these, uh, you know, where, where should we address this? And then there's uh, Nikhil's paper that we got to hear about in a lot, of, lot more detail on Tuesday. And then this paper by Hilla Gonin and Yoav Goldberg, which just came out earlier this year, that showed that debiasing methods cover up systemic bias, um, but they do not remove them, which I thought was a kind of interesting continuation. But this is still, I think, an area of, um, with plenty of potential for, for research that hasn't been settled. Jeremy brought up a good point on Tuesday about how now with a kind of pre-trained language models, there's the bias is going to be present, but in more complex ways uh, when you don't just have linear embeddings. Yes? Yeah, I was wondering if, uh, if most of this work has been done in English or is this in the context? Oh, that's a great question. So yeah, the question was, has this mostly been done in English? To my knowledge, yes. I think that this has been done in English. And I have heard people kind of... Uh, raise the warning that, yeah, like the biases we hear about are typically from English, and there's a risk that, I mean, a, kind of, I'd say a high likelihood that there can be a lot of biases in other languages that aren't getting the attention or study that English is. Um, particularly as uh, kind of many, many tech platforms, you know, are offering services in other languages and translation to other languages, but often without that much, uh, that much support or as many people on their teams who are native speakers of the language. Um, so the impact of bias in word embeddings is uh, kind of bias in Google Translate. G Google Translate has changed this if you only enter a single sentence, uh, but if you enter both the sentences, you do still get a biased response. Uh, which was surprising to me. Um, so this is still what you would get for translating he is a doc, or so you can also do it where you start with she is a doctor, he is a nurse, translate to Turkish, and then back to English, and it comes back with the genders flipped. Rob Spear had a blog post 
two years ago where he talked about a system, a system for restaurant reviews and it ranked me Mexican restaurants lower because the word embeddings had learned negative connotations uh, with the word Mexican. Also, word embeddings improve web search results, um, and so we can see a lot of risk of what if searching for grad student neural networks was more likely to return male names. Then uh, this is about um, automatic speech recognition, is what ASR is. And this was a talk, um, I don't know if you guys have met David Guy Breezen. He taught in this program I guess two years ago, and then ended up switching to the computer science department here at USF. Um, but this is his area of study. And I searched for the original of this image, and I could not find it. But it's looking at speech recognition just from different regions within the UK. And this is pretty neat, because it's, I don't know, at least 15 different regions. And here, the uh, green is uh, correct, red is incorrect. So it's showing kind of the accuracy to air. And you can see there's huge variation for like this region, just a tiny amount of red, it's mostly green. Other regions, I mean, this is less than 50% accurate. There's a huge, huge amount of variation in speech recognition performance. Uh, David highlighted in his talk at the time that speech recognition struggles with um, accents, different dialects of a language, children and elderly people as well. Often their voices sound different and speech recognition is less, uh, less accurate. There was a paper in HBR earlier this year uh, saying voice recognition still has significant race and gender biases. Uh, here's an article from Wired, voice is the next big platform unless you have an accent. Um, so in the, and we haven't really covered speech um, in this class, but it's an area of NLP and an area where there is a lot of uh, kind of risk for bias and products working more poorly uh, for different groups. So then this is from um, Perspective API, which is um, came out of Google, or I guess Alphabet, um, but the uh, Google parent company. And so it's a way to rate uh, comments for whether they're toxic or not. It was released in 2017 with partnerships with the, the New York Times, Wikipedia, The Guardian. It's a lot of high profile partnerships. And uh, librarian Jessamine West discovered that uh, the sentence, I'm a gay black woman, was rated as 87% toxic um, in comparison to I'm a man being seen as 20% uh, toxic. Similarly, there was a lot of uh, uh, bias around abilities, and so making statements, I'm a woman who is deaf, was 77% toxic. Uh, so kind of a lot of concerning bias in how, how things were being rated, as well as just inaccuracy, like these statements uh, are not toxic. And Perspective has been, has been working to address these, but again, this is something that was released and already in use uh, when these things were discovered. <coughs> Uh, this is a more recent article, and this is evaluating a tool that MIT Media Lab was developing to, to rate, con uh, rate tweets about whether they were rude or not. And it was discovered that um, kind of African-American vernacular was much more likely to get rated as rude even when it wasn't and when people were expressing, uh, expressing positive sentiment. Um, and some of this is kind of different in differences in kind of the way people talk, uh, not being captured in the algorithm and so kind of having this higher error rate and, and rating people's language as, as rude when it wasn't. So another, another example of this is a black woman. And so this is, I believe, from 2017, who wrote a blog post on her own blog about being called the N-word. And Google AdSense told her she was violating their terms of service um, for writing this. So this is a, kind of an issue of understanding context. And I think in terms of filtering toxic or abusive con uh, content, to uh, context matters hugely and is something that is very tough, uh, very tough to do. And we see a lot of errors from the major platforms in this. And these errors disproportionately impact certain groups. Um, so this is 
happened just in the last month. YouTube updated its policies regarding hate speech. Um, and in the process of doing so, it removed a lot of historical and educational videos. So it actually um, took down uh, videos showing kind of speeches of Hitler's speech speeches. So these are historical, uh, kind of historical material, uh, which is Nazi propaganda, kind of by definition of, you know, Hitler, Hitler's speeches, but then it's also really important historical information to have um, and kind of as a document of, of the Nazis um, in uh, kind of a World War II Germany. Uh, so one person who was impacted uh, was Ford Fisher, and he's not covered. So this is a Washington Post article, and then this is kind of like a separate separate blurb on the same topic. Um, but he his video footage has been used in Emmy and Oscar winning documentaries, and so he had a few of his videos uh, taken down altogether, and he was demonetized. Um, and one of the videos that was deleted showed protesters confronting a Holocaust denier. Another had been used in a PBS documentary. Um, so there's this kind of issue of context of how do you, because um, it is important to, to document historical and current events um, and kind of separating that out from uh, material that is kind of active hate speech or propaganda. Um, and so I wanted to highlight that as I think that's uh, a kind of a big NLP challenge and something, something to be aware of. And so this is kind of the same mechanism as on the slide and this woman uh, kind of being told she's violating the terms of service um, and that it can make it hard to kind of talk about uh, kind of even the educational or, or not educational, but countering and documenting the historical impact of, of hate speech and of people's experiences. Um, so that's uh, a little bit on some of the some of the NLP, uh, I guess, areas where bias can show up and things to be aware of. And I want to say, that, like, I mean, I think these are all hard problems to address, um, but are very very important to be cognizant of. So returning to this concept I mentioned earlier that the Harini Suresh paper highlighted. Oh, yes. And actually, can I pass you the. Can you clarify with the YouTube example, with the, um, with the NLP um, aspects? Yeah, so this, and I don't know, I guess, oh, well, actually, let me turn that up. So the question was um, clarifying with YouTube, what is the NLP aspect? Uh, that I don't know exactly how YouTube is doing this, but I would assume it's um, analyzing the speech of videos and using some sort of speech recognition on content <coughs> to identify what it's taking down or not. Uh, um, yeah, kind of what to take down, what to uh, demonetize, et cetera. And that that is, uh, yeah, like I think speech would be the, the biggest indicator. It's possible, actually, I'm sure that they, they must be using like some metadata and uh, computer vision as well. But I would think that speech would be kind of like one of the key, the key inputs there. Any other questions about, about this example or the other ones? Uh, certain best practices being formed for like data set auditing Cause, because like it seems like a lot of or one of the reasons why you know we're seeing a lot of these issues with bias is you don't know if um, you're not paying attention to the distribution of the of your test like your yes yes and I guess if some are some categories might be obvious but a lot of them as you said could be latent are there, are there so that's people working on figuring out how to just characterizing a train distribution data set really well. And as yeah, so that's a great question. I'm repeating for the microphone. It's uh, what work is being done on kind of auditing training data sets and yeah, auditing the distribution and training data sets of uh, what's included and what's not. And that actually I'll get to later in the, the solution section. Um, but the kind of short answer for now is that that is an area of research. Um, but we're also kind of, I think, in the very early stages of adoption around it. But you're right that that is a I think an important component that many different groups of researchers are starting to point to as like this is a basic building block we need to kind of e even just have the information of what's in these training data sets and how are they created. Any other questions? All right, yeah, so going back to this, you know, uh, 
This concept of bias data is often too generic to be useful because um, it gets used very broadly and it's an important concept, but if you want to go beyond just identifying this as a problem, uh, we need more of a framework around this. Um, and so I highlighted this paper, which I found really helpful. Uh, Harini also wrote a blog post version of it, which is great. And this is, in general, I have a plug for, uh, I want more researchers to write blog post versions of their academic papers, because I think you can reach kind of a broader and different audience by doing that. Um, so yeah, they, they identify that different sources of bias have different causes. Um, it, Harini writes, data models and systems are not unchanging numbers on a screen. They're the result of a complex process that starts with years of historical context and involves a series of choices and norms from data measurement to model evaluation to human interpretation. Um, and so I think data can seem very black and white, but there's a lot of context and choice that goes into it, um, into how data, data sets are created and how they're used and how models are trained. Um, so in the paper, they identify five sources of bias, although I believe they're working on an updated version with even more that offers a little bit more granularity. Uh, but I wanted to, to walk through these. So we already saw a few of these uh, in the earlier case studies. So there's representation bias where the, your training data was not reflective of the data that the model is going to be used on um, in production or in the real world. And then when this is kind of happening for benchmark data sets and impacting kind of entire fields and lots of companies, uh, they call that evaluation bias. And so we saw that many of our benchmark data sets that have been widely studied are biased, um, including a lot of the facial recognition data sets and ImageNet um, having this strong Western bias. So then, so let me get another drink. There's a paper I like by Sandil Malanathan and Zayed Obermeyer, where they look at historical electronic health record data with the goal of discovering which factors are most predictive of stroke. Um, and so this is something they say could be useful for figuring out how to uh, kind of prioritize people waiting at the ER of who needs to be seen. And so they're looking at a large number of factors from this historic health record data. And they find the number one most predictive factor of stroke is uh, having had a prior stroke, which makes sense. <clears throat> and the second most predictive is cardiovascular disease, which also seems reasonable. The third most predictive factor of having a stroke is accident accidental injury. Next is having a benign breast lump, having had a colonoscopy, and sinusitis. So these uh, factors three through six, I see a lot of puzzled faces. Yeah, they don't make any sense, right? Like why would these things be predictive of having a stroke? Um, and this was looking out of kind of comprehensive health record data. Um, and so what's going on here? Uh, this really does not seem good at all. And so what the, what the researchers identified is, we haven't actually measured stroke, right? Stroke is, you know, brain cells being deprived of oxygen because they're not receiving new blood. Um, really, what's been measured here is who had symptoms, went to a doctor, received test, uh, received a diagnosis of stroke that was entered into a medical health record, right? So this is, you know, and on the surface, that might sound similar, like, okay, is this a, a pretty good approximation of stroke? Uh, but really, uh, what's going on is there are people that utilize healthcare more than others. Um, and this is for a variety of factors of who even has access, who has health insurance, who can afford their copay, um, who can afford to take time off of work. There are a lot of biases in the medical system of how, uh, how women are treated, how people of color are treated by doctors. And so really what their, what their model has just found is there are people that go to the doctor when they're um, having a problem and people that don't. And that's ended up uh, kind of being what was measured. And so if you're likely to go to the doctor for an accidental, in in uh, accidental injury or for sinusitis, then you're also likely to go when you have a stroke. Um, and so that's, that's what got measured. And this is an example of measurement bias, which is, I think, pretty, 
pervasive uh, to some extent. Like typically what you truly care about is not something that is or in some cases can even possibly be measured. And so you have to use these proxies. And so in healthcare, you know, you're, what ends up getting used is kind of these diagnosis codes or billing codes, which are actually pretty far removed from the actual, you know, the biological processes going on in any illness. Um, and so this is a risk, and measurement bias can take, let me see if I have more there, can take a few different forms. Uh, they give another example in the paper of, sorry, in the Harini Suresh paper, uh, switching back of, say you had, if you were measuring uh, mistakes for a company that owns many factories, if the way the mistakes are measured is different at different factories, you're data is not going to be as useful as you want if they're kind of you're taking inconsistent measurements. Um, so this measurement bias can show up in a lot of different ways. And this is a case where getting more of the same da data is typically not going to help you. So here, you know, the results are weird, but even if they had increased the sample size, it probably would have still been the same if they had this underlying mechanism of kind of who's utilizing healthcare versus who, who is not. Any questions about this? Okay, there's um, also aggregation bias is another type. And so the example that is given in the Suresh paper is that diabetes patients have different complications across different ethnicities. And one of the kind of blood indicators used to diagnose and monitor diabetes differs in complex ways across ethnicity and gender. And so kind of trying to model everyone with the same model would probably lead to errors. And this, you can also have, uh, and probably often do have many of these types of biases at once. Um, so this could be, for instance, combined with representation bias. So if one group is so super kind of overrepresented when you're building your model, you might effectively just end up building a model for that one group um, and not realizing it doesn't apply to, to different ethnicities or different genders, depending on kind of who, who you were using data from. Uh, so this is, this is aggregation bias. And then I talked earlier about historical bias, which is a fundamental structural issue at the first step of the data generation process and can exist even given perfect sampling and perfect feature selection. And I think historical bias is pretty pervasive and also particularly hard to address. Um, and so earlier I gave the example from the Compass Recidivism algorithm. Uh, this is also what was going on with the uh, ads suggesting that people with black names had been arrested. Um, and with Amazon's kind of internal resume screening tool that penalized the word women's. So I want to talk, to, uh, talk a little bit more about how and where historical bias can show up. And so the studies I'm going to share here are all from kind of peer-reviewed research that's been done. These ones are linked in a Sandiel Malanathan New York Times article. Um, but this is just kind of like a small sample of the research that's out there on this topic. Uh, when doctors were shown identical fi files, they were much less likely to recommend a, help for, a helpful procedure to black patients than to white patients, um, even when kind of the medical history was identical um, and they were presenting the same, uh, the same complaints. When bargaining for a used car, black people were offered initial prices $700 higher and, re and received far smaller concessions. And again, this is in peer-reviewed research, uh, kind of looking at it um, as, as a statistical sample. Responding to apartmental, apartment rental ads on Craigslist with a black name elicited fewer responses than with a white name. White state legislators in both parties were less likely to respond to constituents with black names. And an all-white jury was 16 points more likely to convict a black defendant than a white one. But when a jury had one black member, the conviction rates were the same. Um, and so this kind of variety to me uh, indicates that you know we've got examples of medical data, sales data, uh, I don't know, that's a combination of sales and housing data, political data, and criminal justice data, all having this racial bias. And so it's kind of no matter where you're drawing your data from or what domain you're working in, I think there's uh, a likelihood that you're going you're gonna to have racial bias in your data. 
uh, to talk a few, just a few stories about gender bias. And these I all uh, I cite in a blog post I wrote several years ago called If You Think Women in Tech is Just a Pipeline Problem, You Haven't Been Paying Attention. Um, investors preferred ideas pitched by a man than an identical pitch from a woman. Male narrated pitches were rated as more persuasive, logical, and fact-based than the same pitches narrated by a female voice. Um, and so that's kind of reading identical scripts, getting a very different response. Job applications with male names were rated as more competent and hireable and offered a higher starting salary compared to identical applications with female names when rated by science faculty at six major universities. Uh, when men and women negotiated a job offer by reading identical scripts, women were rated as being more difficult to work with because they had negotiated, whereas the men did not see this penalty for negotiating. In performance reviews of high performers in tech, negative personality criticism, such as abrasive, strident, or irrational, showed up in 85% of the reviews for women and just 2% of reviews for men. Um, so kind of a lot of, again, a lot of different areas where bias can show up in data that is, um, you know, about funding or performance or salary, um, kind of other areas. And so all this raises the question of why does algorithmic bias matter? So I've just showed that humans are really biased too, right? And this is you know, one of the ways that bias ends up in our algorithms is that our, kind of our human data is biased. Uh, but this often, yeah, leads people to kind of ask this question, humans are biased. Um, so why, kind of why are people making a big deal about algorithmic bias? Um, in fact, Pedro Domingos, who's a machine learning professor at the University of Washington, um, asked this question last year. Um, he was sharing an HBR article that looks at a few studies in which um, algorithms were less biased on particular tasks than a human decision maker. Um, and so I wrote, I wrote a response to that because I think that article missed a number of things um, about implementing, uh, implementing computer algorithms, which I'll talk about in a moment. But I want to I wanna answer this, uh, this question about why, why algorithmic bias does matter and why, as data scientists, it'll be your responsibility to, to be on the lookout for it and to address it. And I have four reasons for this uh, that I'll go through. Um, and the first is that algorithms and humans are used differently. And so we saw earlier uh, when talking about this IBM Watson uh, dashboard used for predictive policing that a city official said, you know, machine learning is always 99% accurate. Um, and that's false, but it's a common misconception and people are more likely to to judge the outputs of a computer as being objective and being correct, um, which can be dangerous. And so algorithms often end up being used differently than human decision makers. And so it's a, it's a mistake to talk about kind of human decision makers and algorithmic decision makers as just plug and play interchangeable, because in practice they're often implemented very differently. Um, and the way this shows up is, you know, people are more likely to assume algorithms are objective or error free. So even if you have implemented a, an algorithmic system that's just kind of giving a recommendation or a guideline to a human judge, uh, humans might, I mean, humans typically will take it as more authoritative. And also you have to look at the system of, you know, if you have a kind of human that's always overriding the system, are they gonna be, you know, is their boss gonna give them a hard time? Will they be audited for not listening to the system? Um, so even having a human in the loop can not necessarily be a, a safeguard. And then algorithms are more likely to be implemented with no appeals process in place. And so this is something that really concerns me and we've had kind of several really disturbing stories in the US of for instance, there was um, software implemented by the state of Arkansas to determine people's health care benefits. And it turned out there was an error in the software implementation, but there were people that lost. So like, for instance, people with cerebral palsy who needed a home health aid to help them with kind of a task of getting out of bed, getting their breakfast, who lost like 20 hours of care a week that they really needed due to this uh, the software error. And there was no appeals process and no easy way to, 
kind of ask why this decision had been made and the error was only discovered through a lengthy course, court case and it's something that could have never come to light. You know, it's kind of like a, even a matter of luck that it, that it was, uh, was surfaced. Another, another uh, story that's kind of scary is there was uh, software used in, uh, I believe, Virginia or DC to fire teachers and there was no, no way to appeal. The, the mistake and so there was a teacher who she had great reviews from her principal and the parents of her students this is an elementary school teacher really liked her and she got fired by this algorithm and there was kind of no way to appeal it or, or even get an explanation um, algorithms are often used at scale so when they are biased they can be kind of replicating the like an identical bias at scale Whereas even though humans are biased and with very common patterns to our bias, there's at least some kind of individual differentiation. And then algorithmic systems are cheap. And I think these are all very related. Like I think the reason algorithmic systems are in many cases being implemented is not because of their accuracy or better performance, but as a cost cutting measure. And again, I think ha like being on the lookout for mistakes or giving people a way to appeal mistakes typically cost more. And so I think that's often why it's not included, um, which is not you know, a good justification of it. But I think there's a lot of interplay of, of these factors of kind of um, trying, to, trying to cut costs, to do something cheaply and at scale. And it can be very disastrous when there are, when there are mistakes. Any questions about this? And so this is kind of at the core of why, um, why I don't think you can look at humans and computers as, as being uh, just in, interchangeable in a very kind of plug and play way. The, the second reason that algorithmic bias concerns me is that, it, and why it matters, is that machine learning can amplify bias. And so this is a point I covered earlier, sharing the, um, the research studies, bias and bios, and reducing gender bias amplification under corpus-like constraints, um, that it's not always just a case of encoding existing biases, but it can be making them worse. The third reason why algorithmic bias matters is that machine learning can create feedback loops um, and run, yeah, runaway feedback loops. And so this can occur in predictive policing where kind of if the algorithm predicts that there's gonna be more crime in a certain neighborhood, it'll send more police to that neighborhood, which then itself can become a cause in there being more arrest in that labor neighborhood, which can then feed back into the algorithm to be like, let's send even more police there. Um, and this has been written about in kind of computer science papers. Um, but basically, feedback loops occur when your model is controlling the next round of data you get. And so I think, um, I think it can be easy in tech to kind of uh, sometimes underestimate our impact on the world and think like, oh, we're just kind of uh, observing existing data or analyzing existing data. But if that's used in a product at all or in decision making, it's really impacting what your next round of data is. Uh, Suresh Venkatasubramaniam, who's a researcher in this area and one of the authors on this paper, said predictive policing is aptly named. It is predicting future policing, not future crime, um, since this is an area where it's really creating the next round of data that the system gets. We also see this a lot with YouTube, um, YouTube's recommendation system. So and actually, I read the updated stat today. People watch 5 billion hours of YouTube per day. <laughs> That's just this huge number. YouTube has over 1.8 billion active users a month. Um, so YouTube is... Uh, very, very widely used uh, platform. And it has done a lot to, to promote conspiracy theories. And actually, I guess I'll, I'll talk about this more um, next week when we talk about disinformation. But the kind of the mechanism with YouTube is, you know, so on the one hand, it's 
It's trying to predict what people will like, but it's also determining what people see because 70% of time spent on the platform comes from its up, um, up next, which is its recommendation system. When you're watching kind of, you know, on the, the right side gives you this list of recommendations and then it begins auto playing the next one. So that's again, that 70% of the time spent on the platform is these videos selected by YouTube auto playing for people and they disproportionately include conspiracy theories um, that promote white supremacy, anti-vaxxing, climate change denial, a number of harmful of harmful things. And then the, the fourth reason that algorithmic bias matters is that technology is power and with that comes responsibility. Um, so of the global population, 56% uh, of people have internet access, so there, there are many people that don't have internet access, 7% have a college degree, and less than 1% know how to code. Um, and so I think that particularly for all of us, just even being able to be in San Francisco, knowing how to code, uh, being data scientist, that's a huge amount of power. That's an opportunity very, very few people in the world have. Um, and with that, there's kind of a responsibility to, to, to use it well. And I think of sometimes uh, conversations around, you know, human bias versus algorithmic bias degrade a bit into kind of, you know, what's the least terrible existing option we have is, you know, is one thing marginally better than something else. Um, I'd really like to see more focus on how can we develop less biased ways to make decisions, perhaps using some combination of humans and algorithms, um, but build, build systems that will lead to, to better outcomes for, for people. Yeah, and so those are those are kind of the reasons that that algorithmic bias matters. Um, and then I guess this is kind of a perfect time for a break. Uh, we'll return at twelve ten, and then I'll start talking about some steps towards solutions. All right, so let's start back up. Um, so I'll talk about kind of some steps towards solutions with bias. This isn't a problem that uh, we can easily solve or completely solve. Um, and then after that, we'll start on the transformer architecture. So um, kind of thinking about what's something concrete that you can do in response to this. Um, and that would be to, I think, analyze a project at work kind of as you're starting new jobs in the next few months. Um, or you know, there's only a week and a half left. But if you do have any projects at school that you want to analyze. Um, and the first uh, or kind of step zero to that uh, is asking is asking whether it's something that should be built or created at all. Um, and so I have to credit Os Keys for this point. Um, they shared, uh, this is a paper kind of on design, when the implication is not to design, uh, but engineers and data scientists, uh, myself included, often tend to respond to problems with, you know, what can I make or build to, to solve this problem? But sometimes the answer is to not make or build anything. Um, an example that Oss shared on Twitter was research, I believe from 2017, uh, fa facial feature discovery for ethnicity uh, recognition, including of the Uyghurs, which is a, a Muslim minority in Western China. Um, and a million people have been put in internment camps. Um, from this minority, and so this is kind of showing prior to this, research was done on how to how to recognize them with facial recognition. And so this is a kind of really disturbing application of computer vision. Um, there is also, you know, there's been research on uh, trying to tell someone's sexuality from their pictures, and there's a, a lot of issues with even the quality of this research, um, but that's something I don't think we should be doing in terms of a uh, poses safety concerns in many places. You know, the idea that you could you could tell someone's sexuality from their picture. It's also a violation of privacy and kind of self-determination. Um, so really kind of thinking about these questions of, you know, what are the things that we shouldn't build and that could that could be weaponized and used to harm people. Um, and so Kind of on this topic, uh, so IBM sold uh, sold technology to Nazi Germany. A uh, Swiss judge ruled that uh, this probably did help them to be more efficient um, during the Holocaust. And uh, this was, you know, recording kind of whether whether people were Jewish, recording if they were gay. 
Um, and this is, you know, this is not a question of like, how could IBM have like used a different data set or structured the technology different? It's more of a, they shouldn't have been selling technology to, to help the Nazis. Um, and so this is, I think, very kind of sobering, but important to realize. And, and also to realize that genocide doesn't happen overnight. Um, and, and I actually don't know what year the IBM uh, began working with the Nazis, but, uh, you know, it begins with often uh, kind of registering and tracking people from, from marginalized groups um, and then can proceed to internment camps, which can proceed to concentration camps. Um, there's an article, uh, The Role of Data Collection in Genocides, that covers uh, several different examples. Uh, this is a card of, uh, in Rwanda, how people's ethnicities were kind of tracked and registered prior to the Rwandan genocide. Uh, they also talk about the internment of Japanese Americans um, in the United States during World War II, which used uh, U.S. Census data. Um, so this is something to, to, yeah, to really be mindful of. Um, I guess I, I left this in uh, uh, last year, yeah, 2018. Uh, the UN ruled that Facebook had played a determining role in the uh, genocide in Myanmar, um, and this is something that uh, people close to the matter said is not 2020 hindsight. Uh, people were warning Facebook in 2013, 2014, 2015 about how the platform was being used to incite ethnic violence, um, which again is a, kind of an example of genocide not happening overnight. You know, initially the warnings are, this is being used to incite violence um, that kind of gradually escalates. Um, and I think it's important to think about these examples, but also to realize there's a range of technologies that should not be built that um, are not as extreme as contributing to genocide, uh, but something to really, really consider kind of how, how your work could be weaponized in ways that you don't, you don't intend. And so I added, uh, this is, I've kind of put together some questions to ask about AI, and I put this together a few years ago, and just recently added this, uh, should we even be, be building this, is kind of the, the first question to consider. Um, and kind of, so, kind of beyond that, if you determine that the project you're working on is not, uh, not something uh, that you think could be used to, to cause a lot more harm than, uh, than potential benefit. Uh, moving beyond that, it's good to, to ask what bias is in your data. Uh, can the code and data be audited? What are air routes for different subgroups? What is the accuracy of a simple rule-based alternative? So I mentioned this when we were talking about the uh, recidivism algorithm used in the criminal justice system that researchers from Dartmouth found that, you know, here there's, there's, this, there's this 137 input black box model that's doing no better than a linear classifier on three variables. It's really important to have a baseline to even know what is, what is high accuracy. And then asking what processes are in place to handle appeals or mistakes and kind of knowing that I think mistakes will happen with, with computer software. I mean, we're human, we make, we make mistakes with everything and really thinking about how can you monitor to try to catch mistakes as quickly as possible and have a response to, to minimize harm and address them quickly. Because I think uh, kind of some of the scariest stories are when there's, there's no way to even notice or surface mistakes. Yes? Yeah, open AI. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So the the question is about um, open AI. Uh, decision not to release GPT-2. Let me save that for next time because I was going to talk about um, GPT-2 next time in the uh, disinformation lesson. Uh, but that's a good question. And just kind of briefly, it's around this question of they're they're doing a I think they're calling it a staged release, but. Uh, recognizing they were alarmed about some of the risk of their research and so choosing not to release everything that would be needed to replicate it right away. Um, and I think that's also a very kind of like newer discussion to be having within computer science particularly of, um, you know, there tends to be a real culture of openness um, and kind of balancing that with the, the risk. So yeah, I, that's a great question. I'll come back to that next time.
Um, oh, and then also asking kind of how, how diverse is the team that, uh, that built technology or you know, a particular, particular product that you're working with. So kind of continuing with this uh, analyzing a project at Worker School, there are many, many different frameworks you can use to do that. Oh, here's an example. Um, a company was, someone was trying to sell them an algorithm to uh, screen resumes, and they asked for an audit uh, before they would purchase it, and they learned that the two factors most indic indicative of job performance, according to this tool, were being named Jared and having played high school lac lacrosse, um, which is really uh, terrible. In a <laughs> so terrible, it's, uh, it's almost funny, but it's, yeah, it's bad. It's great that the company asked for this audit, though. So this is, I would say, kind of like, in some ways, a success story that they insisted, like, hey, we want to know how this works, and discovered, like, oh, this is terrible. This is not something we should use, because um, it's definitely better to discover that before, before you start using the product. And so um, next I'm going to talk about NLP data statements. Um, and this is get, getting back to the earlier question of kind of like how do you, how can we audit our data? And <clears throat> this is a paper that came out uh, pretty recently from Emily Bender and Batia Friedman. And um, it's also worth looking up. Batia Friedman wrote, I think, one of the original papers on uh, data and algorithmic bias in the 90s, um, kind of classifying three different types of bias that's, that's worth looking up. Um, and so part of, part of these data statements is recognizing that all data has bias, uh, biases in it. You're not going to get perfectly uh, kind of bias-free data. Um, and so we just need to be aware of what those biases are. Also, no system is immune to emergent biases because you can kind of get this interaction of, of what biases arise uh, when you're using a system. And so the goal is to provide context so developers and users can understand how results might generalize, what the appropriate uses of particular software is, um, and what biases might be reflected in systems built um, on the software. So they give an example of, so basically the idea is kind of when you create a data set or using a data set to really just record a lot of the choices that went into creating it. Uh, so, and that I really loved, Nikhil had a great slide on this of kind of all the questions of like, who, who curated this, gr this corpus of books that was used, like what choices were made in that, who was left out of it. Um, and so uh, the Emily Bender paper recommends, yeah, what was the, <coughs> the rationale behind the curation, who made those decisions, what was the variety of languages, and um, Emily has spoken up a lot about, you know, not often the kind of, I guess, particularly the American NLP community will often kind of assume English is the default or just not even say what language they're working with when they're working with English, but really specifying uh, what language you're using and also what variant, because um, even uh, within English, there's a huge amount of variation depending on um, who, uh, who you're talking with and about the demographics of the speakers. Um, the demographics of the annotators. Uh, so if you're using labeled data, the people that did the, uh, the labeling, that's significant and is gonna impact uh, what those labels are and potential biases in them. Uh, the time and place of speech, characteristics of the text, uh, quality of the recording for, uh, for audio. Uh, as well as other information. And so this is a, kind of a lot of potential things that can play into it, and they have kind of more specific recommendations about this is for the long form, but also having like a shorter form that's a single paragraph that could be more easily shared. Uh, but th this will be useful for anyone kind of using that data set in the future or using research that was done on that data set. And so there's been a number of kind of groups working on similar ideas. They all have different variations. I chose to highlight the NLP statement since this is an NLP course. Uh, there's uh, <coughs> this idea of nutrition facts for data. Um, and so kind of a way to kind of show some key, key factors about, uh, about data. 
There was Timnit Gebru et al. wrote data sheets for data sets, which is, that was one of my favorite papers last year. And Timnit's coming from electrical engineering background and kind of modeled it off of the data sheets that come with electrical components like uh, circuits or resistors. And this is more, um, this was kind of a little bit more generic than the NLP statements and that it was geared towards kind of any data set in machine learning. Uh, but that was, that was a great paper. A group from Element AI in Montreal came out with this idea of data licenses, which I think is really interesting, but kind of in creating a data set saying who, who can use it and how it can be used and what the appropriate uses are, because, you know, some data sets may be appropriate to use in one context, but not another. Um, and just getting kind of some of that more context out there. And so this is, uh, I think, a really interesting proposal. Um, and even though it has Montreal in the name, it's not just for Montreal, uh, but kind of wanting this idea of to have, you know, standard licenses around data sets is interesting. And uh, in the uh, ben Bender and Friedman paper, they talk about the fact that, you know, similar groups are kind of proposing uh, or sorry, different groups are proposing these similar ideas around giving more context about how data sets were created and how they should be used as kind of a confirmation that this is an idea that the field is converging to. It's still in its early stages and that, you know, while many of these papers propose potential formats, it's not something that we've developed you know, definite standards around. They have still, you know, kind of are in the early stages of adoption. But this is something I think really to kind of keep an eye on and to, to start including in your own work. Any questions about this, uh, this concept of kind of how to audit your data set? Something else that's nice is uh, both data sheets for data sets and uh, and NLP statements give examples too in the paper of kind of sample data sets and what would what would a data sheet or an NLP statement for that data set look like. Something else you can do in kind of auditing a project that you're working on or in your workplace is to check the accuracy on different subgroups. Um, so we've seen this gender shades example a few times throughout the talk now. And here I just want to highlight how important it is that uh, Joy looked at dark women specifically as a subgroup. Um, if she had just been looking at men versus women, kind of light-skinned women would have brought up the the accuracy for women, and then if she had looked at uh, dark skin versus light skin, uh, or sorry, yeah, dark skin versus light skin, dark skinned men would have brought up the accuracy for the dark skinned group, and you wouldn't have seen kind of how truly terrible this is on dark skinned women. And so kind of having that intersectional, looking at each subgroup on its own is important. And it's just, yeah, I know it's wild that this can happen in commercial products that were released. proactively recognizing risk and addressing them. Um, so this is a positive story from Meetup. Uh, when Meetup was implementing a recommendation system, uh, recommending what meetups uh, people might be interested in, uh, and this is from a talk Evan Estola, the lead machine learning engineer at Meetup gave, he, kind of the team, recognized the fact that fewer wom women were interested in technical meetups, and so there was a risk that the recommendation system would learn not to recommend technical meetups to women. However, going back to this concept of feedback loops, you know, the meetup isn't just predicting what people will like, it's also informing people of what exists. And so this could cause fewer women to even find out about technical meetups that they might be interested in, which the system would then learn to recommend even fewer technical meetups to women. And so they kind of chose to try to short circuit that in their design of the algorithm. And so that's a great example of kind of proactively recognizing a risk and coming up with a solution. So that's a kind of, yeah, some guidelines towards just even how you could analyze, analyze a project at work or school. Second step uh, towards uh, doing better and reducing bias is to work with domain experts and those impacted by, um, by the products we're building. And so I gave the example earlier of Christian Lum, uh, statistician from the Human Rights Data Analysis Group doing this by partnering with 
a former uh, public defender as well as an innocent man who could not afford bail and had been um, and who was labeled as high risk uh, by this algorithm <coughs> to really share a lot of kind of this knowledge about how these systems work in practice and what human systems they're interacting with. A uh, third, uh, third thing to do is to increase diversity in your workplace. Um, I really encourage people to start at the opposite end of the pipeline, the workplace. So there's um, often a lot of talk about, you know, getting more little girls into coding. Um, however, 40% of women working in tech end up leaving the field compared to just 17% of men until, and then kind of until this attrition rate is a, addressed, getting more women into the field is not gonna fix the gender or address the gender imbalance um, as long as those women kind of leave. Uh, a meta-analysis that looked at hundreds of books, articles, and studies on this topic concluded that women are leaving the tech industry because they're treated unfairly, underpaid, less likely to be fast-tracked than their male colleagues, and unable to advance. Uh, and this uh, kind of too often diversity initiatives end up just focusing on white women, which is wrong. Women of color are facing even additional obstacles. Uh, there was a study that interviewed 60 women of color working in STEM research, and 100% of them had experienced discrimination. Uh, the particular kind of stereotypes and types of discrimination they experienced varied by race. Only half of black and Latino graduates uh, with computer science degrees from top universities are hired by major tech companies. Um, and so this is kind of another reason why uh, looking at kind of how, how companies are currently operating is very important and that they're kind of overlooking a lot of qualified applicants. And then there was research from MIT showing that organizations that promote meritocracy actually show greater bias um, in favor of men over equally performing women. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of research on this topic of kind of why, why we need to address the workplace um, and kind of improve, improve the environment in the workplace. <clears throat> I've uh, linked to a lot of this research in two blog posts that I wrote. Um, if you think women in tech is just a pipeline problem, you haven't been paying attention, and the real reason women quit tech and how to address it, and each of these links to kind of dozens of, of studies on the topic and offers some concrete steps. And then here are some headlines of kind of about black and Latino graduates being overlooked and the, yeah, believing in meritocracy kind of has the opposite effect. And then one, one step back from kind of improving the work environment is looking at the hiring process. And I know, I know I'm sure you, some of you I know are still interviewing and are kind of feel like, might feel far away that you're going to be on the other side of the table, but can it happen very quickly? Like I've been in jobs where really like in my first or second month they have you interviewing people. Um, so it's good to kind of already, um, already be aware of this. Uh, <coughs> research shows diverse teams perform better. I've written a post on how to make tech interviews a little less awful. Um, there's a lot that's broken about the interview process in tech and it's painful for everybody, uh, no matter who you are, uh, but often in ways that can kind of disproportionately impact people from underrepresented groups. Um, you don't have to be a manager to make a change. Uh, Julia Evans, who's a software engineer at Stripe, wrote a great blog post about how even as an individual contributor she was able to kind of come up with a rubric just initially to improve her own consistency in interviewing and it ended up being adopted by the whole company um, so I thought that was pretty inspiring and a tip on kind of how we can start start improving the interview process any questions on on this yeah, so file this away for later because it'll. I think you'll hit it sooner, sooner than you might expect. Um, then the the next step is um, advocating for good policy. I think that we're facing a number of problems that won't be solved by technology alone. And you know, as someone coming with this math and computer science background, I definitely relate to and experience the impulse that I kind of. When I hear about a problem, I want to use the things I'm good at to try to address it. Uh, but many of the problems I think we're, we're seeing right now are going to need a combination of tech and policy to address. Um, in particular, I mentioned earlier kind of the human rights and civil rights that, that need to be safeguarded. 
And then I think with regulation, it can be easy to focus on regulation that is stupid or doesn't work um, and to take for granted the things that are working well. Something I really liked about data sheets for data sets is that they cover three case studies of how regulation and standardization came to different industries. They look at the electronics industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and car safety. And I ended up getting really interested in car safety and kind of read uh, or listened to some more about it. Um, but a few things I hadn't known is that early cars, um, there were sharp metal knobs on the dashboard that could lodge in people's skulls in crashes. Non-collapsible steering columns would frequently impale drivers. And then even after the collapsible steering column was invented, it wasn't implemented right away because there wasn't a financial incentive for the car companies to implement it. Um, but it's something now where collapsible steering columns have saved, they said, more lives than anything other than seat belts. So seat belts is number one and collapsible steering columns number two. And then there was also just kind of this belief that car, you know, cars were just kind of this neutral piece of technology and the issue is how people use them. And so it took consumer safety advocates and activists decades to kind of shift the national conversation on this. The car companies were very resistant to people even talking about car safety. They did not want data, uh, data even being collected on car safety because they didn't want people thinking about crashes. Um, and so that was kind of a major win by consumer safety advocates even to get the data collected. And now the culture has uh, very much shifted in terms of car companies brag about their safety and sell that as a feature. Um, but that's an idea they were very resistant to. Um, and so this was, this was interesting to learn about. Another, another fact I didn't know is that in crashes of a similar impact, women are 40% more likely to be injured than men. And it was only in 2011 that they updated the laws about uh, crash test dummies that they should also represent the average woman anatomy and not just men. Uh, prior to that, crash test dummies were kind of based on men's bodies. And so that's kind of what was being used to, uh, you know, for the safety standard. And so I think this is kind of like an interesting case study of kind of how these cultural and technical considerations uh, kind of mesh and combine. Um, and then as I, as I shared earlier, many AI ethics concerns are about human rights. Um, and I've heard, I've heard some people say that uh, just even the language of ethics can imply kind of that this is something more philosophical or voluntary, um, even though in many cases we're talking about human and civil rights. And then the, the, final, the final piece is that just even if you do um, kind of these first four things, it's never, it's never like you can finish uh, kind of checking, you know, on your checklist, checking everything off and being like, I'm done, I don't have to think about bias, because um, it's, you know, can continue, continue to emerge in new ways, and so it's something to, to continue to be on the lookout for. Yeah, are there any, um, any questions on this? Okay, yeah, this is, I know, a very kind of a large, uh, large topic, um, but it's important and it shows up in a lot of, a lot of different ways.